Good evening, everyone. I'm Maria Teresa Kumar, in for Joy Reid. And we begin tonight exactly one week after the January 6th committee dropped that damning 845-page report detailing their investigation. In an effort to beat the clock before Republicans take over the House next week, the panel released a trove of new transcripts today. It includes some names you might recognize, like former Trump advisor Steve Miller, Trump lawyer Christina Bob, former White House aide Stephanie Grisham, and Alyssa Farrow. Even those of Don Jr. and his girlfriend Kimberly were in there. Here are some of the highlights. Stephen Miller apparently did not remember whether or not he presented three prepared election night speeches to Trump. One for concession, one for victory, and get this, one for unclear results. He also said he didn't recall any conversations about Trump declaring victory, even if it wasn't clear he'd won. The former president's eldest son, Don Jr., also apparently had a hard time jogging his memory, including when he was asked about what happened to the quarter of a billion dollars raised by the Trump campaign after the election. His fiancée, Kimberly, claimed she did not solicit a $60,000 speaking fee for the riot, I mean the rally, on the 6th but that the pay was customary for appearances. She also compared the infighting within Trump world to the movie Mean Girls. And when asked about Ali Akbar, also known as Ali Alexander, she responded, isn't that what terrorists yell? You just can't make this up. We also have Trump lawyer Christina Bob, who told the committee that Senator Lindsey Graham said in a meeting with former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and other White House officials days before the insurrection, quote, just give me five dead voters. Give me an example of illegals voting. Just give me a very small snapshot that I can take and champion, end quote. And former communications director Stephanie Grisham told the committee that even if the Secret Service had approved it, Trump wouldn't have marched to the Capitol saying, quote, I just know him. He's afraid of people. But even one week later, as we are still piecing together all this new information, there are a lot of unanswered legal questions. What does it all mean for the DOJ? Who else is implicated? And will Donald Trump finally be held to account? Joining me now is David Jolly, a former Republican and a former Republican congressman, Charlie, Charles Coleman Jr., civil rights attorney, MSNBC legal analyst, and host of Charles Coleman Podcast. And Hugo Lowell, political investigative reporter for The Guardian. And Hugo, I want to start with you because you have been following this so closely. You have been, have been able to give us all the insights following the January 6th committee. When you saw this treasure trove of information that was dropped today, did anything stand out to you? I think what stand out to me the most was the failing memories of these really high-profile Trump advisors. I mean, you look at people like Don Jr., you know, in addition to the points uh, you brought up before, you know, he couldn't remember whether Rudy Giuliani was around and talking to the president uh, the night of the election. You know, he couldn't remember if there were certain tweets that went out under his own account. He couldn't remember a lot of things. And, and likewise, for Kimberly Guilfoyle, his, his fiance, who couldn't recall uh, certain conversations she had with people connected to the January 6th rally organizers, despite, you know, she being on some of these communications and witnesses placing her at phone calls. So I think this is really a question now for the Justice Department. And the latest batch of transcripts really seem to be uh, areas where kind of prosecutors can now take over and see if they can jog the memories of some of these Trump advisors. You know, it was funny because right before the show started, I was trying to remember what the men in black were using when they were going around. And I realized that I think every single one of them that testified were using neuralizers and basically had their minds swapped, except for a few key witnesses that were lower hanging fruit that were junior staffers who decided to come forward. And one of the things that I found really interesting, uh, David, was the fact that Hutchinson came back and said, not only did I witness Mark Meadows putting paper in the fireplace and burning them, but I also remember clearly Marjorie Taylor Greene looking at the photos and saying, don't worry, my followers are going to be there. KAnon is going to be there. Talk a little bit about that. Is that surprising to you that we're seeing more revelations of this, of Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene really being part of this, what seemed concerted effort? Uh, no, not really. And I think what you're seeing is in an investigation this complex, when you have thousands of witnesses, either your junior staffers or your completely 
uh, ignorant actors of the law are the ones who give you the most information. The obfuscation, the failed memories, those come from your senior members who actually might be facing some type of culpability or liability. And so often they're coached that maybe you really don't remember the specifics and the honest answer is to simply say, I don't remember. So what do we get from Cassidy Hutchison, from Sarah Matthews, who was a deputy to Kaylee McEnany that, uh, who resigned on the day of January 6th? You actually get a lot of honest impressions, some recollection of facts that ultimately tighten the screws on those senior staffers who are saying, I just can't remember the insurrection and I don't remember my role in the insurrection. You know, one of the damning things in addition to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue were the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene and others who are duly elected representatives in the United States Congress that clearly aided and abetted not just the planning, but the day of. We know that there were members of Congress in contact with insurrectionists that day. Ultimately, these are hard cases for the Department of Justice. Most of this comes down to the judgment of voters, but there will be elements that the Department of Justice can look at and make some hard prosecutorial decisions. So, Charles, that's where I want to follow up on. Now that we know that the January 6th committee basically recommended very strict argument of why Donald Trump, possibly Giuliani, Mark Meadows, and Eastman should be prosecuted, possibly. He, they did touch their colleagues. They did touch these members of Congress that David is referring to. What is the recourse, though? Because it does seem that there's plenty of receipts to demonstrate that they were part of this insurrection as well. Well, you're absolutely right. I do think that the January 6th committee focused primarily on Donald Trump and his wrongdoing as it related to everything that happened with the insurrection. But in no way, shape or form should that limit the DOJ in terms of where they can proceed with their own investigation. And if they decide that they want to go after any of his co-conspirators or any of the people who are involved in helping to move this plan forward, they can absolutely do that. And the serious thing that they need to consider is that lying to the DOJ about what it is that you don't remember or fudging a story there is not going to go away so easily as it will talking to January 6th committee and Congress. I think that people need to understand that prosecutors are used to dealing with witnesses who all of a sudden don't have the best of memories and there are tools in terms of an investigative approach that you will take when questioning a witness who claims to have a fuzzy mem memory to try to pin them down. And I would expect that Jack Smith and all the prosecutors who are working with him are going to utilize all of those tools, and we may see additional people prosecuted by the DOJ, even though they told Congress there were things that they could not remember. And Hugo, it seems that they worked so meticulously, the, this, the committee, to ensure that members, anybody, any layperson could pick up what the report was and actually skim through it. I want to talk to you about the chapters. I thought the chapters of how this was organized really speaks to how possibly someone even at the DOJ or so any, you know, individual American pick, can pick it up and really cleanly understand what just happened. And I want to get your take. You know, the first one, chapter one, the big lie. Chapter two, I just want you to find 11,780 votes. That would have been the president. Chapter three, fake electors and the president of the Senate strategy. Chapter five, just call it corrupt and leave the rest to me. Chapter five, a coup in search of a legal theory. Chapter six, be there, will be wild. Chapter seven, 187 minutes of dereliction. Talk about that breakdown. Look, it's a really, yeah, look, it's a really smart way to lay out the story of January 6th. And I think the committee did a really great job in simplifying it. I mean, for those of us who have been covering this investigation and, and, and basically the events leading up to the Capitol attack itself, I mean, these are all of the key moments that preceded the Capitol attack. I mean, it really did start before the election. You have people like Steve Bannon uh, and people around the former president counseling him to declare victory uh, when he when he had clearly lost. You know, that was obviously chapter one, the big lie. But all the way through to the post-election period, you know, for instance, in, in December, mid-December, when he was talking about seizing voting machines, when he met with the Freedom Caucus to start planning out, uh, you know, ways to object to the certification on January 6th. And then, of course, that key tweet, uh, be there, will be wild. And that was really the crux um, in the timeline, which led to a lot of far-right groups like, you know, Stop the Steal, Oath Keepers, Proud Boys. You know, these are the guys that actually stormed the Capitol, gear up. And we actually see a lot of this in the transcripts. And when you read through the transcripts, you know, for, for instance, with Ali Alexander, the Stop the Steal activist, you see how the pieces fit together. But the committee did the report in a way 
um, that you don't need to read the transcripts if you're you know, just dipping into the material. You can read the report and get a sense of just how the president was involved at every step of the way leading up to January 6th.